season of Lent, what does God actually want to show us about himself that will help us to remember and celebrate Good Friday and Easter, the fact that Jesus came to die on the cross for us so that we could have eternal life? What does that God want us to know about him today? And so I want to start today kind of with this. And I think many of us probably can relate to this story. There were two boys who were left to kind of play in a room by themselves. One of them was, they were brothers. One of them was just a little bit older than the other one. And the mom said, why don't you go in here and play together for a while today? And so they went into this room and they started playing. But after a while, what they noticed was that the toy that the one brother had, the other thought was better than his own. Have you ever been in that situation before where somebody else had something that you wanted? <laughs> what did you do to get that toy? I think what happened in this story is something that most of us as human beings will actually resonate with because this picture I think sums it up. Is that all of a sudden the one said, I want to play with that toy for a while. He grabs the end of that stegosaurus, as you can see that dinosaur, and he's basically saying, this is mine. I want it. You've had it long enough. Give it to me. And the other one's saying, no, this is my toy. And all of a sudden, you're starting to get to the point where this fight is about to break out. Right? They're going to start pushing and shoving. I remember doing this with my siblings, and it was no holds barred. When we wanted <laughs> to have a toy that each other would have, whether it was fists, whether it was punching, whether it was yelling, whatever it was, I was going to fight to get that toy. And so all of a sudden you can hear this, this scrap, this wrestling match for this toy just going constantly over and over and over again to the point that whenever there's a fight in the house and you start hearing mine and give it to me, there's usually somebody that shows up that is the mother, isn't it? <laughs> what are you in here fighting about? What's going on? What are you doing? And then they both start telling their stories. And a lot of times, this is exactly the same time, isn't it? He tried to take the toy from me. She's doing this. And it's just going back and forth and back and forth. And finally, she realized that as you're looking at that picture, that it's the kid in the striped shirt who is instigating and trying to pull a toy that's not his. And so finally, the mom steps in. And she goes over and says, we don't take toys from other people. We don't hit. We don't do these type of things. Say what? Say you're sorry. And so then, let's say, the boy in the striped shirts goes to evaluate his decisions very closely there because he's going to say, am I going to apologize? Or am I going to face my mother's wrath now? Yeah, keep fighting? That's what I say so too. Thank you, Diane. Right? Fight for what you want, right? <laughs> so... So the boy in the striped shirt goes to the guy in the solid shirt and he goes like this. I'm sorry. The boy in the blue shirt goes like this. You're not sorry. You didn't even mean it. I'm not accepting that apology. Give me my toy. You didn't even want that, right? It was there. That act of forgiveness there was really hard for that kid because the one in the lighter blue shirt was really offended. And judging by his size, probably could have been incredibly hurt. You did it on purpose. You're not sorry for this. Have you ever been there before in any of your relationships? Where somebody offended you? Where somebody hurt you? Sometimes deep to the soul, sometimes physically. And you look at them and say, your apology wasn't sincere. You can't make up for how you hurt me. Have you been there before? Raise your hands if you have. Many of us have. How many of you did that to somebody else? Right? I think if we're honest with ourselves, it probably happens more often than not. Right? Humanity's main issue that we find here is that it is so difficult to forgive, isn't it? It is so difficult to forgive when we're hurt. It's so difficult to forgive somebody that offended me to the very core. It is not in human nature to be a people who forgive. Forgiveness is often a difficult thing for people. And I wanted to ask you this today. What would be a good definition of forgiveness? What would be a good definition of forgiveness for us today? Okay. Letting go of our hurt. 
Anybody else? What do you think? What does it mean to forgive? To forget? Okay. To repent of it? Be set free? Yeah. Okay. So I went and I, every now and then, like I said, I like to Google or ask Siri what she thinks of it too because I think Siri's got some wisdom there every now and then. And so she goes to the website and will tell me, basically, what is humanity's definition of forgiveness? And I found it incredibly fascinating that every time I looked for a definition, it had to do with money. <coughs> Why is it hard to forgive? Because forgiveness is actually erasing a debt that somebody owes to you. When somebody hurts you, they owe you something now. Part of you has been hurt. Part of you has been crushed. And there is a debt there now that needs to be paid in order for that to be made right. Right? And forgiveness is so hard because in essence what we're being asked to do is to erase the debt. Totally gone. Wow. That's not human. That's not human. That's not in our nature. How do I know that's true? How many of you like the student loan debt forgiveness program that the government is trying to put out right now? Why don't you like that? Why is it not fair? No accountability. no accountability. All the things that you just said, guess what? That's what forgiveness means. Now let's take it out of the political realm and put it into the spiritual realm. That same fire is what is in our soul when somebody hurts us. Because they owe me. That's how much it hurts us. And that we find that this is what forgiveness is. It's wiping it clean. It's like erasing a text message so that it's just not even in your stuff. Like it never happened. It's hard. Because we remember the pain. The scar could be right here. And my jacket during this message is just going to keep rubbing it and rubbing it and rubbing it to where I remember it. And yet forgiveness is something incredibly different. And I think that is so powerful for us. Because even though humanity struggles with forgiveness, forgiveness is at the very heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because every one of us in here, everybody look around this room real quick. You might see some people you know, you might see some people you don't know. There's one commonality that every one of us has is we've all offended God at some point or another. To the point where we have a debt that we owe him that we cannot pay. Our sin costs us something. It's a wage that basically just struck at the very heart of God and caused him offense. Because every time we sin, in essence, it's like slapping the face of God in disrespect. Hmm. And yet, one of the most powerful things that we can see is God said, you know what? My love for you goes way past the debt that you owe. And so I'm going to come to this earth as Jesus Christ did for us. He was born as a human, faced the temptations, the difficulties, the abandonment, all of these type of things, knowing full well that he was going to the cross at Calvary and he was going to allow himself to be crucified in the spot that was mine all so that he could pay my debt. And I think it's amazing that 2,000 years ago, as Jesus was hanging on that cross, he was paying the debt that I owed before I ever had anything to pay. That's the very heart of God. God wants to offer forgiveness for us. That's the gospel message that Christ paid the price for our sins, removed them from us, rose again on the third day, conquering death so that we could have, through faith in him, life everlasting, a life of forgiveness with God. That is the glory of who he is. And it's at the heart of the gospel. And as we've been going through this message series illustrated, we've been taking a look at this fact. As human beings 
who have been called by God's glorious grace into relationship with him through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, one of the things he wants to do now is he wants to produce in us his character, his hope. He wants us to become more like him. And if we are going to have the very heart of God, that very heart of God must, as we're going to see today through Matthew 18, must be characterized through an attitude of forgiveness. And so today, I, fir- I firmly understand this, that as we start talking about forgiveness and hurts and offenses and all those different type of things, it might start rubbing that scar all open again for us. I fully understand that. But you know what I'm praying for us today is that even though those scars may rub, that Jesus would walk through it with us as we, as we deal with it. That he would bring healing that he would bring grace and comfort. So let's pray as we begin to unpack this. Jesus, thank you so much that as we look to this passage, Lord, you are so amazing in your character and nature that you are the God who longs to bring hope to the hopeless. You want to bring healing to the sick. You want to bring joy to the joyless today. And so God, as we walk through this time together, we're trusting that you're going to be here with us opening our hearts and minds to the things of you so that Jesus, the whole point of forgiveness is freedom, as I believe it was Aaron who said it. It's to be set free from the stranglehold that unforgiveness has on your people. And God, that's why you hate it so much. And so Lord, I pray today that you would free us from the enslavement to unforgiveness. Show us your character and nature as we're going to unpack this parable today. And we pray in all things you would receive that glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Raise your hand if you like conflict. Nobody, but yet, how many of you had a conflict this week? Raise your hand if you had a conflict this week. Right? I would be willing to venture a guess. You had a conflict. If you're married, you probably had a conflict with your spouse. You might have had a conflict with children, right? Ever since the fall of mankind, conflict is a very human thing. We face it all of the time. How many of you think you handle conflict well? Good, because I think humanity stinks at it. (laughs) Right? I think we all take it. There's a point where we're going to take this conflict very personally. And that's not what Christ has for us, but it's very human. It's very much who we are, right? Ever since the beginning of history, you have the conflicts that exist in wars or struggles, right? But these also have come to define daily aspects of life. Have you ever had a conflict in your marriage? Yeah, right? That's just a forgiven, right? Is that when we come and do premarital counseling, I spend at least a session with people on how to handle conflicts. What is the leading cause of divorce in this country? Marriage. (laughs) Give Diane the microphone. She's got a message for today. (laughs) I got to tell you, I don't get thrown off very often. That was a good one. (laughs) I think that the number one leading cause of divorce in this country is that we don't know how to do conflict. I think a lot of times people will say, oh, we have irreconcilable differences. What does that mean? You didn't know how to handle your conflict. Oh, money was a leading cause of divorce, so you didn't know how to talk about it, right? I think sometimes what happens is this is a very human thing. We have conflict in our friendships. We have conflict with coworkers, right? Your boss is a jerk. The people won't get moving, whatever it is. Ah, this is 2024. What is happening this year? Conflict. (laughs) Right? Because we've elevated politics to the point of identity and we don't know how to talk to people anymore. Right? We can disagree on politics. We can disagree with our neighbors. That's absolutely fine. The problem is, is we don't know how to disagree and let conflict go away. Right? It's there. But you know, one of the interesting things is, is one of the spots where conflict, it should almost be a conflict-free zone But I'm afraid to say that as a pastor in my 20 years of ministry, there is no place that has conflict like the church. 
There is no place that has conflict like a church. The very people who are redeemed by God seem to be the very people who can't forgive one another and have conflict all the time. It's amazing to me. I can't tell you, and I've been using this phrase now for a few years, and I, I have been floating it around inside of even some of our staff and board gatherings, and I even set it down in Orlando, and everybody's just like, mm-hmm. And I said this, I said, there is no organization on the face of this earth that can devour their own like the church. Have you ever been hurt by the church? I could do a dance with as many hands and fingers and toes as I'd need to get up. Because for some reason, we all think it's okay to hurt everybody else's feelings. It's there. It's constant in words and actions. Sometimes we're not even aware of it that we've done it. But it's, it's there in Jesus even going into his disciples now in Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20, Jesus knows that conflict is going to be a huge issue for us in the church. And so in those verses, he actually gives us the process of how to handle it. What should we do with conflict? Well, the first step that Jesus actually gives us in Matthew 18 is to actually go to the person you have conflict with and work it out. The problem is, is that most of us never get to that point because we're too afraid to have a conversation that usually can be cleared up really quickly. If that doesn't work and you can't get restoration, you can't get forgiveness, all these different type of things, you should take a witness with you. If that doesn't work, you should call in the elders. If that doesn't work and the person still won't come to forgiveness, then we need to excommunicate so that they understand why we need forgiveness. And Jesus gives us that process and he was taking his disciples through that, which I find very fascinating. And so if you want a good read today, go read the rest of that passage because that's not the part that we're going to get at today. Because what we find is that as soon as Jesus gets done unpacking what it's like to deal with conflict, the apostle Peter asks a really important question that I think for many of us is probably on our minds today. Where he says this starting in verse 21, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, and I bet every one of us has asked this question before, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? What's he basically saying? How many times do I have to forgive this person when they hurt me? Have you ever asked that question before? Absolutely we have. As many as seven times? Hmm. I find it very interesting that something was actually happening here because the rabbis of the time were actually taking and looking at, and you can write these passages down if you want something else to look at. The rabbis would say is that you only needed to forgive somebody three times before you just cut them off. You find that in Amos chapter 1 verse 3 or Job 33 verses 29 through 30. So Peter was actually upping the game of the expectations through here. He was multiplying it by a bigger amount saying, should I keep track of how many times that person hurts me and seven times I'm going to forgive them? In my mind, I automatically go and saying, so what happened on the eighth time? But Jesus, in the way that only Jesus can do, he said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but how many times? 77. You might have a translation of the Bible that will say 70 times 7. So whether it is 77 times or 490 times, what is Jesus actually saying here? Don't keep track. Don't keep track of how many times they've hurt you. Your job isn't to remember the sin. Your job is to work forgiveness. And then as Jesus does oftentimes, he goes into a parable of saying, hey, listen to my story now so that I can help you get a better understanding of what's going on. And so that's why during this part of this message series illustration, we've been looking at a lot of parables. And so then Jesus goes on now in verse 23 and starts to say these words. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. And so the timeout moment there is the servants, we need to understand this, is that the servants in this context, whoever could have amassed such a debt as this, who we're going to see in a moment, were probably the governors underneath him that were, that were involved with government oversight, collecting taxes, all those types of things. And so when it says that the king wished to settle accounts, it was time for them to pay what they owed. 
Okay, whether it was tax money, whether it was their debt, right? And so it was time to settle up. It was time to settle the check. You're just getting done with dinner. It's time to pay the bill. And verse 24 then goes with this. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Let's take a time out moment there and just try to grasp what 10,000 talents is. And by the way, this was of gold. How much does a talent weigh that we talked about two weeks ago? 75 pounds. So what's 75 times 10,000? Hmm? 750,000 pounds of gold. How much is one ounce of gold go for today? Tom actually looked it up for me earlier, so I know the price, and I'll give you a roundabout number. Gold is going for $2,000 an ounce. So times 2,000 times 16, right? Huh? <laughs> right? This is an amount this man was never going to repay. Never. One talent was equal to eight years of wages at this time. for most of the laboring type of class. What's your salary for eight years? Now multiply that by 750,000. That's quite a debt, isn't it? The problem is, is this guy got this debt probably through embezzling. That's what the commentators had to say. And I was just like, I like the probably on it because he got it through dishonest gain. You cannot borrow that much money, <laughs> right? It can't be there. He had to have gotten it from somewhere. Now he's got to put this all back in. He doesn't have it. And so 25 goes and says, and since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment was to be made. Wow. So the servant fell on his knees before the king, imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. Knowing full well, he never could. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. What did he do with the debt? He erased it. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, right? Like a couple months worth of money. It's like you borrowed $10,000 from your parents or something like that, All right? It's not insignificant, but it's manageable, okay? He owed him a hundred denarii and seizing him, began to choke him, saying in essence, pay me what you owe me. So his fellow servant fell down. And pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all of his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Wow. Ready? Amen, closing prayer. Let's go bowling, I think, at that point. Boy. That just hits you. It hits us. This is what Jesus is actually telling us. This is what it looks like to forgive one another. This is God's expectation. And so what do we see as Jesus is sharing this parable? I think what we need to do, I think today, is look at the hearts of the two characters, the master and also the servant, and see what is actually compelling them to their actions. 
And so let's take a look at what we see here. The first thing that we look at is with the master. Let's look at God's character that is fully on display. And so when you read those first couple verses with me and you saw the character of the master, what did you notice from him? What was the character that he displayed and made up? What are some things? Compassion. Compassion. Hmm? Sentimental? Yeah, he really cared. I think that's a good one. Anybody else? What do you think? I think he was patient. I think he showed a heart of love. I think he was forgiving. He was understanding. I think that you look on here that he was so understanding and so forgiving that he was willing to cancel a debt that could never be repaid. 10,000 talents of gold. Yet he wiped that debt clean simply because that servant came and asked him. I think God was just waiting for him to come. That's the heart of our Father. That's the heart of God. He wants to forgive, He wants to love, He wants to be gracious and compassionate. He wants us to come to him so that we can experience that forgiveness. I love what Colossians chapter 2 verses 13 and 14 say for us today. It says, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven what? All of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross, basically killing it, paying for it himself. God wants relationship with us so much that he is willing to wipe away all of the debt that we have had, that we had in the past, and that we will have in the future because he wants that relationship with us. And all we have to do is come. We have to come to him. We have to believe in him. That's the nature of the master from this spot. But then we see a different characteristic of the nature of the servant. I think we see out of the servant that he knew he was in a bind. He knew he had nowhere else to go. And when he was brought to account, this was a guy who at least went to the right place, but he was making excuses for it. He was begging for patience to pay off this debt. Uh, just have, just have, give me some time to do it. He was trying to come up with all of his man-made excuses, and none of them were going to work. And yet God still had patience in that way. Hmm. And so he experienced forgiveness. And I got to say, I would have expected that someone who experienced being forgiven so much would have had a different response to the neighbor. Is that kind of true? How did he respond to the other servant? <laughs> I was almost going to ask for a volunteer who wanted to come and volunteer to be choked and see what that feels like, right? Right? But that's what he did. He didn't care. No grace, no compassion, no patience. He had this guy thrown, thrown into debtor's prison until he could pay off his debt. So riddle me this, Batman. How do you pay off a debt and, create, and get an economy to be able to make money while you're sitting in jail? Basically what he's saying is, I will not forgive this guy. Get him out of my sight. I hope that he never makes it. Wow. Wow. Which one of these are we like? Yeah, we tend to act like the servant a lot of times, don't we? Been there. Done that. Praying that we get freed of it. Because the point of the whole thing is that we need to be a people who are characterized by forgiveness. I find it very interesting that as I think about my life or people around us is that we often view our being offended or hurt by somebody as way more serious than when we hurt somebody else. Whatever happens to me is more important than whatever happens to you. That's humanity. And that's what you see in this picture. 
the, the servant thought by the person not paying him back was a much greater offense than him not paying the master back, even though the money was incredibly different in that part. And I think that's very human. It's very carnal, but it's very real. But what Jesus wants us to understand is that to be a people who are characterized by forgiveness, we need to understand that this is the message of the gospel. That every one of us in here owes a debt that could never be paid. And we are guilty because of that of the fires of hell. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is what? Death. That's what we deserve. But what does God tell us? Now, I want you to come to me because I came to pay that debt so that you could be free, so that you could have it be wiped clean. Jesus paid it all, as the hymn says. And what we have to remember then is that we need to, if we're going to have the heart of God, we need to forgive because God has forgiven us so much. Just in this week, how many times have you offended God? And what did you do? I want you to think about that for a minute. Hmm. Now do you realize in Christ, it's all forgiven? It's gone. It's like it's been erased. Right? Right? That's the message of it. Are we willing to do that for others? Hmm. So I think there's some questions we want to ask ourselves today from this. And I'm praying that you take this home and really start to unpack it a little bit because this is supposed to be, a message on forgiveness is not a message that is supposed to get us into a downer. This is a message that is supposed to be, okay, Christ wants to break the shackles of unforgiveness off of us so we can live a free life. Live the life of hope and joy. But I think we need to do this hard work first. And so, what do I do with all of this? Let's ask ourselves a couple questions. Why do people struggle so much to forgive? I think you need to ask that of yourself. Some questions that we need to answer is this one, because friends, it's personal. To be hurt by somebody and then cancel the debt that causes so much pain and so much hurt for us, this is hard. And I got to tell you this, it's unnatural for a human being to do that. It's more natural for a human being to hold the grudge. Can we forgive it? Even though the pain is difficult. Even though we try to separate off from people and say, I am never going to allow this to happen to me again. And sometimes, isn't that why people sometimes pull away from the church? Because they don't want to get hurt again. <laughs> hmm. A few years ago, my assistant pastor and I took, we were riding in the car and we had to run to the post office real quick. And as we were running to the post office, it was kind of starting to come out of one of those seasons that was difficult inside the church. It was a little bit post-COVID, but it's never been post-COVID. And so Joe and I drove over to, to the post office where we were pastoring in Sydney. And as we look up, I could tell that he was having a lot of hardship on his face. And so we look up as we're walking to the post office and we see a sign there in the post office that said, mail carriers wanted, $20 an hour plus federal benefits. And both of us just looked at each other with a smile on our face and said, wouldn't that be nice? You know, the mail isn't out to get us. The mail doesn't say hurtful things. The mail doesn't uh, operate in these type of ways. I could deliver the mail. I can run away from a dog, you know, because we delivered mail on foot in town. I think so how many times. It's such a temptation to run away from the spot where you feel pain because that's very human. But God wants to free us from that. God gives us a different way to look at it. Because what we have to remember when we struggle to forgive somebody 
and we put up these defense mechanisms, what we really need to rely on is we need to actually just sit almost with our palms open and go like this, Holy Spirit, I need you to work in me. I need you to work healing in me. I need you to work forgiveness in me because, Lord, I'm having a hard time doing it right now. And when we sit in the presence of God to remember the things he's forgiven us about and allow the Spirit to work in us, that's what heals our wounds. And we need to remember because I think we forget how much we've been forgiven as believers. I think we need to ask ourselves that question. How about this one? Have you ever asked this one before? What if I just can't forgive someone? Yeah. (laughs) Yep. I've heard this said by more than one person. I will never forget what you did to me. Man. Never? We're going to carry that around forever? How many people harbor sin inside of our souls? That we carry around forever. By the way, what is a harbor? It's a safe place. <laughs> Why are we putting our unforgiveness in a safe place? <laughs> we do it. What if I just can't forgive someone? I think what we have to remember is this. Is that to say this is the same issue as the servant. And so if I share the heart of God, our forgiveness of others must be in proportion to how much God has forgiven me. I think we need to see God's working to move on again. God forgave the unforgivable in me. Somebody else might have really hurt you. But if we seek the heart of God, we can be freed from that. Ah, I think Aaron mentioned this one earlier. Are we called to forgive and forget? Or are we called to just simply forget or forgive, but I'm going to remember it forever? What are we called to do? I googled this one too. I can't tell you how many websites out there tell me that forgiveness is good, but you don't have to forget. And I want to ask the question today, can you really forgive if you're not willing to forget? What does God do? Uh, Jeremiah 31, 34 And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The psalmist writes that God separates our sins as far as the east is from the west from us. So how far is the east from the west? Do they ever touch? No. Do north and south ever touch? Yes. Right? Where do north and south touch? North Pole and South Pole, right? You can go so far north in the world, and guess what's going to happen? You're going to get to 90 degrees, and what's going to go on? You're going to start going south. When you fly to Europe, I don't know if people realize this, that when we would fly to Germany from, from Newark, New Jersey, that the path that we would actually fly took us right over the heart of Greenland to get into Germany. We would go north until we were going south. East and west never come in contact. The God of the universe is telling you that he is taking that sin as far as the east is from the west. Jeremiah tells us he never remembers it. I don't know how we can truly forgive and live in unity and live in peace and live in grace and live in satisfaction if we constantly think of the offense when we look at the person. Can't happen. If you're willing to forgive but not forget... You're not doing it God's way. And I think that most of us in here really want God's way. So I think that's why we have to ask ourselves that question. So our response today, I think, is this. For some of us in here today, We might not have ever experienced the real forgiveness of God that the relationship with him brings. The being washed clean of our sins through faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe that's something you need to experience today. And I would just make this altar available for us at some point here. To come. To seek his face. 
to ask him for his forgiveness because God wants to give it. He wants to give it before you even want to ask for it. That's his gracious nature. If you're in here today and you struggle with forgiveness and letting it go, and I'm willing to bet that some of the people that we need to forgive in this room is ourself <laughs> as well. Are we willing to let that go to God today, to forgive it, to forget it, and to lay it down before him? Because what this forgiveness does is it breaks the shackles that tie us to a spot where it robs us of our joy. And so as we close out today, this altar is open. I'll pray with you. I would love it. Others will as well. Um, if it's at the bowling alley today, come talk to me. I would love it. I'm not good at bowling anyway, so I'd rather talk about God. So <laughs> take this verse with you today. So I think this sums up really what God's heart is for us in that relationship. Be kind to one another. Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another. As God in Christ forgave you. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you. I thank you that you're the God of forgiveness. Lord, because I, standing here today, know that I need your forgiveness constantly. I'm constantly messing up. And yet, Jesus, you so freely offer that forgiveness that you wipe my record. Lord, I think other people would say the exact same thing today. But Jesus, in our relationships with others, may we be quick to forgive. Not holding on to these hurts, even though they hurt, but we're trusting you to heal. But Jesus, may we forgive. May we walk in unity all for your glory's sake. And Lord, for those who need to come today or those who need to, to pray today or forgive today, whatever it might be, Jesus, I pray that you would just give them courage to deal with these hard things. But Lord, show us through these hard things of your incredible majesty. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, bowling happens in a few minutes you can head on down there if you signed up if you didn't sign up we would still love to have you so would you stand with us as we close our time together in prayer remember our bible study starting tonight at six everybody is welcome to that in that room over there let me pray for us jesus we pray that through the almighty blessings of the holy spirit laid upon us today that we would experience you that we would be filled to the measure by you that as we go today we would experience you anew and afresh. So bless us in our homes, bless us in our relationships, bless us as we work and bless us as we serve, as your ambassadors, as we study and go to school. Bless us today, God, with your immense presence. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Had a fantastic time with you. Be blessed everyone today.